really today, Paul is hitting on this identity aspect. He's hitting, uh, he's really talking about our identity as followers of Jesus. See, because we're called to be different than our culture. Our culture is lost. Our culture is deceived, going a different way, and we're called to be different than that. We're, we're called to be different than the way that our culture is living, and we're called to mature in our faith. In a way, Paul is telling us here in Ephesians chapter 4, you need to grow up. And that's the title of today's message. You need to grow up. Uh, my whole life, even to this day, I've still heard that phrase, you need to grow up. Uh, it's been said of me often. I've had people say, Nate, will you please grow up a little bit? Like, you know, which is just their nice way of saying you're not acting your age, you're acting a little immature right now. You can ask my wife, I'm 37, but she might say at times I'm acting like I'm 18 or when I'm around the boys, I'm acting like I'm 10. You know, like there's just sometimes I act that way or you can ask anybody on Awakened staff. They can testify to the fact that sometimes I don't act my age, that uh, there are times where I like to be a prankster or I like to joke around because life is relatively serious. And I could take life serious, but I feel you got to find those pockets of joy in the middle of all of that seriousness. And so I like to goof off and, and enjoy life as much as I can. But there are some times when I'll see a documentary on the 90s or the 2000s, or uh, I'll be uh, seeing a vintage commercial, or I'll see some vintage toys, and I think, oh, if I could just be a kid again, how great would it be to go back and be a kid again? Maybe you're the same way. Maybe you're like, man, I wish I could be a kid again. I wish I could go back, but we can't go back, can we? There's no way we can go back. And in Ephesians 4, Paul is reminding us as believers that we can't be living like we used to. We can't go back to our childish ways. We can't go back to living like the culture has told us to live. We need to grow up, to mature in our faith and live differently than the world. There are things that used to mark our lives as unbelievers, things, the ways that we used to live, things that we used to do. But now in Christ, we are called to live differently. We need to walk different, live different than how we used to live. So let's read what Paul is telling us here. In chapter four, starting in verse 17, he says, now this I say and testify in the Lord. He's saying, this is where I'm getting all my authority, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensu sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Verse 20, but that is not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness." Paul in these verses are opening our eyes to the way our old life was, to who we really were. He's showing us that there needs to be this huge difference, this huge change in us that how our culture operates versus how we should operate as believers. That if we've truly been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, that if we've truly surrendered our lives to Jesus and asked him to come into our hearts and into our lives, that should change everything about our lives and how we live in this world. It should change how you live in the big ways and in the small, everyday ways of your life. The gospel changes everything. And so Paul is writing this letter to a group of Christians who began to live in a way that was different than how they should be living in Christ. So to unpack um, these verses, I want to give us two truths about our identity. The first one is this. Our identity should be different than it used to be. Our identity should be different than it used to be. Here in Ephesians chapter four, Paul is drawing a line in the sand as followers of Jesus, how we should live versus how our culture lives. And in these first few verses here, 17 through 19, Paul is a little dark. He's painting a very bleak picture of our lives. It's a little depressing at first as we're looking at it. 
But look at how he sets this up for us. He says in verse 7, 17, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must know or that you must no longer walk or that word walk could be translated live as the Gentiles do. See, right off the bat, Paul is challenging these Christians in Ephesus on who they are and how they're living. He's, he's not holding back. He's not being soft with them. He's saying, you're not Gentiles anymore. Now, when we read that, we might be tempted to think, well, is Paul trying to minimize or belittle their culture or their heritage? And, and what he's saying, that's not what he's doing at all right there. Because that word Gentiles could be translated people who do not belong to the family of God. They're not Christians. He's calling all Christians, all believers to not live like the world is living. He's telling these Ephesians, don't live like the Gentiles, your old way of life. And he would tell us today, hey, awaken church, don't live like the unbelievers. Don't live like the unbelievers in Clarksville live. Because of who you are in Christ, it changes how you live right now. In fact, this reminds me of a Johnny Cash song. I don't know how many of you are fans right now. I know my dad is watching and he's a huge fan of it right now. But uh, I don't know how many of you are fans of Johnny Cash. But he wrote um, a song called I Walk the Line. You might be familiar with the song. It was his first hit, his first number one single. And the story goes that he wrote this song uh, right after being married to his wife backstage. And he wrote this song as a way of uh, acting, as a way of devotion to her. And so if you're familiar with the song, the song goes, because you're mine, I walk the line. Yes, I'll admit that I'm a fool for you. Because you're mine, I walk the line. You guys know it, you've heard it. This is the thought Paul is trying to talk about here in Ephesians. He's like, hey, you Ephesians, since you have this new relationship with Jesus, you are to walk the line. You are to devote yourselves to Jesus. I would say to all of you here who are believers, you have this relationship with Jesus. You need to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You need to devote yourselves to Jesus. So how are our lives supposed to look different? Well, Paul is going to point to three ways that our lives should actually be different because of Jesus. Now, again, in verses 17 through 19, he paints this very dark, very bleak, kind of depressing picture of our lives before Christ. But it's important that we look at it. And so the first one, he says that before Christ, our minds were futile. Look at verse 17 again. It says, you must no longer walk or live in the futility of their minds. Before Christ, our minds were futile. The word futile means unable to produce any useful results. See, it speaks of emptiness. It speaks of aimlessness. It speaks of lacking purpose or any kind of meaningful end. See, what Paul is trying to say here is apart from Jesus, it's like you're running on a treadmill, trying to get where you want to go in life. And you're running as hard and as fast as you want, but you are going nowhere. It's like they're striving, but they're never finding. They're living lives of emptiness. We all want purpose, and we all want meaning in our life. We all want our lives headed somewhere. We all want a goal, a target to aim for. And I would argue that being a Christian, following Jesus, actually gives us that purpose. It connects us to that purpose uh, as human beings, to give us that meaning, to give us that, that desire, that goal. Here's what I mean. All of us as humans, we've all been created in the image of God, meaning that we look like God. We're his image bearers to the world. We're supposed to join in God's work in this world. But Adam and Eve, they rebelled, they disobeyed, so sin entered the world. And now because of sin, all humans are broken image bearers of God. We are created in the image of God, but we don't reflect God like we were supposed to reflect God. We don't reflect him popular, uh, properly, but God didn't leave us on our own. God had the solution. He sent his son Jesus to come to this earth, to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death that we should have died. And he rose again, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave. Satan was defeated. And because of all of that and Jesus is alive, we now can come to Jesus through faith and trust and join in the work that God is doing. We've been given the task of joining with Jesus to bring this world back to him. 
It's an amazing thought. You've been given access. You can have a relationship with him. You can walk with him. You can know him. You can live with him. And it's huge and it changes everything. Paul's saying that now that you are in Christ, stop living your life of emptiness. Stop chasing after all these things that you think are gonna bring you happiness. Stop having this futile mindset. You can't be kids anymore. You can't be chasing those childish things. You need to grow up. That's what he's telling us here in verse 17. But he continues this thought in verse 18. Not only are we to have futile minds, but before Christ, our hearts were hard. Verse 18 says, they are darkened in their understanding due to their hardness of heart. Paul is using this imagery of spiritual blinders right here. We're unable to see the things of God. Now, Paul, when he uses that word hardness, it could be translated callous. And what he's getting at is that around our hearts, there is a hardness that has made us numb to feeling the things of God. Now, when I read that, I understand what it means to be callous because uh, I learned to play guitar when I, was a, when I was really young. I've been playing for uh, 25 years now. And uh, I remember the first day. I really remember that first day. I picked up that guitar and I started playing. My hands were soft and I would like try to make chords and I would like, it would start to hurt after time. Like I, I, I remember one time I was playing so much that my fingers started to bleed. It got that bad. And I remember going, oh, this isn't good. And I was kind of wiping the blood off. And I noticed on the neck of the guitar, there was all kinds of blood as well. So I was constantly playing, but I pushed through all of that pain. And what eventually happened was I got calluses on my fingers. So then it wouldn't hurt anymore. I could play for hours and hours and I wouldn't feel the pain. I became numb to those metal strings. Now, if I walked over here and picked up this guitar because I don't have as much time to play anymore and so now it kind of hurts when I do play, my fingers have become uh, softened to the guitar strings. And this is what Paul is trying to get at. He was like, you once were soft to the things of God, but now you've allowed this hardness over your heart. You have become callous to the things of God. He's like, you shouldn't be living that way. Don't live like you have this callousness over your heart. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, he says this in 1 Corinthians 2. But people who aren't spiritual, meaning those who don't know Jesus, can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them. They're callous, they're spiritually blind, and they can't understand it. We once had spiritual blinders on. We were callous to the things of God. I don't know if you've ever tried to share your faith uh, to an unbelieving friend before, but maybe you did that and they kind of like looked at you like you're from Mars. Like, what are you talking about here? And it's not that your friends are stupid. It's just that they have spiritual blinders on. They are callous to the things of God. They have their spiritual blinders on. And this is a good reminder for us today that Christ drew us to himself, that we once were numb and callous and blind, but God turned on the lights and he drew us to himself. And Paul is saying to these Ephesians, it seems like some of you are putting your blinders back on again. You can't see, you're acting like you don't know God. You're, you haven't been soft to these things. Don't live like that. He's made you able to see. He's removed those blinders. He's softened your hearts. Stop acting like you don't know him. Stop trying to go back to your childish ways. You need to grow up. And so then he continues, and it all culminates to this verse in verse 19. He says, before Christ, our flesh had total control. Before Christ, our flesh had total control. Verse 19 says, they have become callous and have given themselves up. See, this is a willing choice. This is us giving into our flesh given ourselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Paul says, not only have you turned away from God, but you've turned towards other things. It's the things of the flesh. Now, when I'm talking about things of the flesh, this is who we were before Jesus. He's like, hey, you think you found freedom by giving into your flesh, by doing all these things, but that's not what's happened at all. You've actually become enslaved to other things. 
You've given yourself up, but you're now addicted to some other things. And you need more and more things of the flesh. Your flesh had total control. Here's what you need to know about your flesh. It's never getting better. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. It could be one week, one year, 10 years, 20 years. You could be a pastor of a church and it never gets any better. You're always at war. You're constantly battling your flesh. If you're being honest with yourself today, you would understand that there is a constant war, a battle with you and your flesh. Our flesh is never satisfied. Our flesh goes from thing to thing to thing, trying to find fulfillment. So what do we do? We go to relationships. We go to stuff. We go to money. We go to sex. We go to all kinds of different substances. And all of these things fall very, very short. It's like we're trying to climb this mountain that we think is going to give us satisfaction. And when we finally get to the top of the mountain, we look out and we see all the other mountaintops and we realize that it never worked that we never got satisfied. So Paul here paints this very dark, very bleak, depressing picture of who we were in verses 17 and 19 about our identity and how it should be different. He's telling us here in these verses, you need to grow up. Stop living like children. Stop trying to go back. You need to grow up. That before Christ, our minds were futile. We were callous. We were blind. We were giving in to the flesh. But Paul's saying, don't live like that anymore. I think it would do us well before we move on to verse 20 to really pause and to look at this list right here and to understand that list describes us, that we were futile, calloused, and in the flesh. That's our story apart from God. And today, if you aren't in Christ, If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, according to the Bible, this isn't who you were. This is who you are. But the good news is this. There is someone chasing after you today. That while you're chasing after all of these things that you think will will give you satisfaction and happiness, there is someone chasing after you with his grace and with his love. I love that our God doesn't say, hey, this list here, this is who you are. Good luck. But God says, no, I sent my son Jesus to die for you. This is our story. There's nothing we could do about it, but because of Jesus, God did something for us. And so if you're here today and you're far from Christ, you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. This is your story, but it doesn't have to always be your story. In a few moments, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus into your heart and into your life. Or maybe you're kind of acting like these Ephesians. You went back to your childish ways. You went back to the way you used to live. And you're coming back because you realized that you weren't satisfied. You gave in to the flesh and all these other things. And so you're here today and you've given in and maybe you realize you need to come back to Jesus. In a few moments, I wanna give you an opportunity to come back to him as well. So verses 17 through 19, they're kind of depressing, but Paul gives us the hope here in verse 20. He says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Here's the second truth about our identity. Our identity requires daily surrender. It requires daily surrender. This phrase, the way you learned Christ, is relational language. Meaning that when you became a Christian, you don't just learn about Jesus. You develop, you cultivate, you grow in your relationship with him. It's not saying you learn some facts about a historical figure in a historical time through a historical book. And so you decided to change your life and live a little bit different. That's not what it's saying there. It's not saying that you learned about Christianity or learned about how to be a good Christian. So you changed your life and you're good. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that as followers of Jesus, we didn't just learn about Jesus, we learn Jesus. Now, it may seem like semantics. It may seem like, well, what's the big difference there? But there, it is a huge difference. It's the difference between religion and relationship. See, it's an intimate knowledge of a person. This is firsthand experience. We didn't just learn about Christ, we learned Christ and we've experienced him. And what Paul is telling us is that because we've experienced Jesus, our lives require daily surrender. 
See, no matter how long you've been following Jesus, you know the struggle is real. We just talked about it. We said the flesh never goes away. There's a daily surrender that has to happen in my life and in your life that's at constant war with the flesh. Yes, I can have Jesus in me, but there is a constant battle going on. I love what Paul says in Romans chapter seven, and this is very loosely paraphrased. This is more the Nate translation right here. It says, I know what I'm doing is wrong and I don't want to do it. I know the difference between right and wrong. But sometimes I don't do the right thing and I do the, very, the wrong thing. And I hate that I'm doing the wrong thing. But then later he says, but thank God the answer is in Jesus. See, there's always going to be this constant struggle. There's always going to be this daily battle. But you have to daily surrender yourself. You have to surrender those habits, that lifestyle, so that you don't revert back to those sinful lifestyles that we just talked about in verses 17 through 19. And so Paul gives us two ways on how we need to daily surrender. And the first one is we need to lay aside the old self. Look again, verse 22, it says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. What he's saying here is this more or less speaks of the idea of changing clothes. We take off the old self, we lay it aside because that's not who we are anymore. But I want you to notice that word self because it's all inclusive. It's everything about you. It's your whole life. It's the way you live, how you think, what you believe, what you love. It's how you live your life. We have to daily surrender our old selves. Paul, writing to the church in Colossae, he has a similar idea. He's challenging this church. He says this in Colossians 3. He says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Put to death. We might read that and go, that seems a little harsh, like a little overkill maybe, Paul, but it's not at all. Listen, every single day we are going to war with our flesh. See, if you want to grow, some things need to change. And, to w- and the way that you change is you let some things go and you grab hold of new things. I was thinking of a, a swinging trapeze artist when I, when I read that verse, right? So when they start out, they go and they grab a bar and they're swinging because they want to go forward. They need to keep going. And so eventually they're going to have to reach out and grab another bar. But what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to let go of the other one so they can reach out and grab the next one to keep moving forward. But if they don't and they hold on, they're going to get stuck in the middle. They're not going to go anywhere. And eventually you're just going to go down and that's not good. Paul is saying you need to put off your old self. You have to let go of those old patterns, those old habits, those old ways of thinking. You need to let go and keep moving forward. You need to grow up. It's not very encouraging to hear that it's a constant battle. But here's what's encouraging. With God's amazing grace, we can win. Remember, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Jesus does everything. But we can't leave this place going, ding, ding. All right, here we go. I'm ready to fight my sin. That's not how it works at all. We have to daily depend on Jesus. We have to lay aside the old self. Because here's the reality. We're all in church right now. We go, okay, I get it. I need to lay aside the old self. There's some things I need to lay aside. I got it. Okay, I'm good. And we can feel really good about it in this place right now. But then we're going to leave here. And maybe even before we leave the parking lot, it might happen in the parking lot. Someone cuts you off. That old flesh is going to come out a little bit. And you're going to have to learn to just lay it aside. Tomorrow when you go to work or you go to school, and your uh, boss or your teacher or uh, coworkers or classmates are going to say something to you and it's going to rub you the wrong way. And that flesh is going to want to come out and give them the one, two and the what's up, right? Because you're like, you don't talk to me like that. <laughs> so we have to learn to lay it aside. Tonight, when you're around the family table and you're eating and you're talking, or maybe you're going to call somebody in your family, you know they might say something and it's going to rub you the wrong way and your flesh is going to want to come out, but you can't let it. Whether you wrestle with any of those things or lust or greed, anger or pride, whatever it is for you, you got to put it aside. You got to lay it down. But how do we do that? How do we put off the flesh? I believe one of the answers is that we just have to call it out and say, that's not who I am anymore. 
We have to remind ourselves of our abandonment of that sinful lifestyle. So when we come face to face with any of those situations with our boss or our coworkers, maybe you come face to face with lust, anger, pride, greed, whatever it is for you. When you come face to face with that, you need to say, that's not who I am anymore in Christ. I've abandoned that lifestyle. Because the reality is we linger in sin when we should be laying it aside. We dwell in sin when we should be putting it to death. And sometimes we coddle our sinful habits when we should be killing our sin. I have to remind myself often of this phrase, be killing sin before it kills me. There's a war and don't forget this. It's not you killing sin in your own power and in your own strength because you can't do it. It's Jesus, but by the Spirit's power, you're saying that's not who I am anymore. So you gotta lay aside the old self. So just, but just as you take something off, you have to put something on. And this is his second thing. We are to put on the new self. Verse 23 says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We're to take off the old self. We're to put on the new self and we're to renew our minds. That word renewed is in the passive voice, meaning that it's been done to us. So what does this look like in our lives? Well, we're abandoning our lifestyle. We're laying it aside. We're putting on this new self and God in his grace, he's gonna come to us and he's gonna say, I'm gonna renew you. I, I'm not, you're not that person anymore. I'm gonna renew your mind. I'm gonna remind you of who you are and what I've called you to be. We've talked about how our world would love to label us. We talked about how our enemy would love to come against us and say, you aren't a Christian. That's not who you are. You're not covered by the grace of God. We know we have an enemy who would love to say, well, you're lustful. You're greedy. You like to lie. You're a thief. You're addicted to all these things. You're a lustful person. And the enemy would love to come in and label us with all of those labels. But the good news is because Jesus went to the cross for our sins, because he died and he rose again. That's not who we are anymore if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. We actually have a new name and a new label. And those new names and new labels are beloved. They're chosen. They're redeemed. They're forgiven. They are favored, they are loved, and they are a child of God. That's your new name. That's your new label. But it requires daily surrender, me putting the old side of self and being renewed by the Spirit, putting on the new self. The reality is we need to wake up each day and get in our Bibles and say, God, I'm feeling a little old today. God, I'm feeling that old nature coming on. I'm feeling that old spirit. Would you renew me by your spirit? Would you remind me of who you are and who I am in you? Amen. The truth is there's gonna be times where you're not gonna feel that way though. There's gonna be times where you don't feel those new labels, those new names, but by God's grace, that is who you are. So because of who we are in Christ, we need to grow up. We need to go from the futility of our minds to being calloused and hard-hearted to push away everything, uh, giving the flesh total control. And we need to take on who we are in Jesus. We can't go back. We can't live like our culture lives. We need to live like believers in Jesus. God's ultimate goal for us here on earth is not our comfort, but our character development. And how we do that is through daily surrender, growing spiritually and becoming more like Christ. You gotta put off the old, put on the new by being renewed. I wanna close with this story. I, uh, I was talking with Pastor AJ about this text this week and it reminded me of a time when Jen and I first moved out here when the church was starting up very early on and we were doing an outreach. And... Uh, I had to wash this shirt and I guess I didn't dry it enough. And so didn't really think much about it. Went outside. We started doing this outreach and the wind shifted a certain way. And I went, oh, what is that? And because I'm not always the most perfect person, I started judging everybody around me. Who didn't shower? Why? I mean, come on, you left the house stinky. Like what's going on? Like what's happening? I'm ready to like start judging everybody and all of that. But then the wind would shift and I wouldn't think much about it, I'd keep going around and occasionally I would get a smell of something awful. And I'm like, oh, are we just like in the worst spot? Like what's happening? 
And so I, left, I went, hey, I'm going to go grab some lunch. Do you want anything? And so I went to grab Jen and I some lunch and got in the car, turned the AC on full blast. And what do you know? I smelt the smell again. And I went, oh, what is that? And I started like freaking out because I realized it was me. I was the smelly person. Let me tell you, that outreach was one of the longest outreaches of my life. I was like, this is the worst. But let me tell you, when we got home, I couldn't wait. I took that shirt off. I threw it in a corner in the room. And I went, I never want, I think I burned the shirt. Like I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And I ran to the closet. I grabbed a new one. I smelt it. It smelled great. And I put it on. This is the idea Paul is trying to communicate to us today. That we need to kill. We need to get rid of those old lifestyles. Why would we want to wear the smelly shirt when Jesus has done everything for us and has made us clean? And the question for you today is, are you willing to put to death the sinful habits, the things that you're coddling? Are you willing to kill it? And are you willing to step into what God has called you to be and live the life that God has called you to be? Trust me, a life apart from God is wearing a stinky, smelly shirt. But when you put on a new clean shirt, it is fantastic. Amen? Amen. 